Hello and welcome. What we'll to do for a few minutes here is talk about passive wireless discovery. I don't know that there's anything surprising in this one. We'll just review a couple of things that you probably already have thought about, maybe didn't put it in the exact context of this. But here we go. The objectives are explain how security information can be gathered by social engineering, phishing, and other techniques. May have already tried, done, thought about those types of things. The information gathering from a security standpoint, if you were on the other side as a hacker, is something that can take a tremendous amount of time. All of this intrusion that we're talking about and we're on the other side trying to protect it isn't like you see in the movies where they're sitting there typing real fast and getting in. What we as network administrators have to do is figure out what techniques we can use to protect the network to prevent those users from getting into the network. The easiest way to get in obviously is social engineering and phishing. If you want somebody's password, simply ask them. Maybe they'll tell you. If they do, that's all you need to do. It's happened before and phishing attacks obviously work because they keep doing it. If it wasn't working, people wouldn't keep sending those things. And when we talk about phishing, phishing kind of a general uh, attempt to get people to run things to open up ports to allow access to their machine or their network. What we are seeing a lot of today is spear phishing, things that are very targeted to specific individuals. War driving, define war driving, talk about war driving. You probably already know what war driving is, where we drive around and try to find open access points. There's also war flying and even war walking. And you can do that, the war walking or the war driving, probably with your... Uh, smartphone because there are a number of tools that you can put on it to detect wireless access points as you go from location to location and what we're looking for in this is open wireless access points or access points that have weak security on them. Hardware and software used for war driving we'll look at that that's in the book you can read that list. Packet sniffers can be used in a wireless LAN. Uh, I want to show you a couple of packets from a wireless uh, sniffer from Wireshark that's used on Linux and when you're using sniffers in wireless you cannot put a Windows machine into promiscuous mode so you can only see things layer 3 and up. If you're going to use promiscuous mode you need to use a Linux machine. Uh, Kali Linux Backtrack are really good ones to use uh, with the live DVD, CD, DVD, so that you can boot that device to your laptop and uh, then be able to access the lower levels once you put it into monitor mode. Monitor mode being the uh, uh, specific that we would use to, to, uh, to get the lower levels of the system. General information gathering, uh, the things that we can use, social engineering, phishing, and properly recycled equipment. This includes paper as well as hardware. Uh, a number of people when they do hardware, although I think people are getting better about it now, just simply run a delete, delete everything, whatever else, to make the information go away. I remember a few years ago, several years ago now, I bought a used laptop from Overstock. When I got it, I was just curious if there was anything on it, so I ran get back on it and found out that sure enough there was a bunch of information, not anything that I tried to pursue, I just wanted to see what was there, and there was some leftover files, a number of leftover files from a database, so improperly recycled equipment. I think what a number of people do today is when they do recycle equipment, take the hard drives out, which you should do, and you need to destroy the hard drives. You can either, you know, they use the magnets, the hammer, whatever else that you want to do with them, or you can send them away to one of these big companies that have hard drive shredders. Search engine scanning and dumpster diving are other ways to do information gathering. Dumpster diving, kind of messy, maybe not as 
productive today as it had been in the past when people really did throw away things that they didn't realize how important they were. And uh, perhaps we're getting less paper usage in a number of some, at least, municipalities, uh, locations have made it illegal to go into people's dumpsters because of that. Social engineering, tricking someone to access a system. What you do is try to get them to give you the credentials. This is so-and-so, call up uh, the, the knock, the networking people, the re password resetters, and identify yourself as some high-ranking individual. Be excited, excitable that you have something that you've got to get done right now and you need password reset. And in some cases, they'll do that for you. When I go to my internet accounts, even, even the ones that maybe I don't consider as important as some others do, you have to go through a whole series of questions to verify that you are you before you get that done. The threat of consequence or the implied threat or the actual threat of consequences to the individual can cause the people to react in a way that they wouldn't if it was a calm uh, environment. Uh, common characteristic, no technical skills, absolutely no technical skills at all, uh, no tech hacking. And if you haven't looked, you may want to look on YouTube and search for no tech hacking. Pretty good video there about different things that you can observe to help you in the no tech world, in the hacking world. So people breaking to break into the system, no, no technical skills, friendliness, frustration, helpfulness of a company employee. A couple of things from my past experiences. I used to have a boss who would call up, and this was in the military, call up uh, an installation and ask to speak to the second in charge. And he would go through what issue he was having and say, you know, I really don't want to have to bother your boss about this, but I will if I have to. But if you can take care of it. And the second in charge, not wanting the boss to be bothered about it, would do everything that they could do in order to assist him. So things like that may help you. Friendliness, people want to be helpful in most cases, and we have become a uh, customer service-oriented economy where everybody wants to do everything. Of course, you've got to tell them how good you did after every time that you do anything, but to reveal information. A couple of things that you can look at here to get information. Look at one ads. Uh, if they're looking for IT people, they're probably going to tell you the skills that they want. If they say that they need an Active Directory administrator, pretty good bet that they're running Windows. They may tell you they want a Linux administrator for certain things or what kind of SQL that they're running. So those kinds of things are all part of information gathering. Best defense against social engineering, written policy. Written policy will help, but if there's no enforcement of the policy, that's not going to do a whole lot. Training is one of the best ways to do that. Show people what these things, what the attack, these attacks may look like. Be sure that they know that when they get there that they can identify them, and you may want to even run some drills at doing this because uh, people when they get these things may not realize what's happening to them until it's too late. If you've gone through a couple of exercises, maybe they can recognize the things immediately. Phishing is the electronic version of social engineering. You get an email from a header that looks like it's someplace legitimate, says that they need you to do this or need you to do that. Uh, one of the stories from way back when is that the boss's secretary got an email from purportedly IT saying that the boss's computer had a virus. Would they please go to this internal server and download the file that was there and run it on the boss's computer in order to destroy the virus? 
Well, of course, when they went to the internal address or apparent internal server, downloaded the uh, file and ran it, it was the virus. So electronic versions of social engineering is what we're really talking about here. Sending an email or displaying a web announcement, false claims uh, to be a, a legitimate enterprise, attempt to trick the user into surrendering information. Click on this to change your log on information. Give us, put, fill in all your information, including your social security number. You, you I at least see those on a fairly regular basis. Click this link. And when you click that link, you'll go to a site that looks like the legitimate site, but really isn't. Uh, be careful of those things. The other way around that is when you actually type in a legitimate address we use DNS, DNS spoofing in order to send you to a different IP address so that you go to, again, a site that looks like the correct one, but it really isn't. It's, it's a place to steal your credentials. So we can do those things. And getting websites is really not all that difficult. There's a number of different pieces of software freely available that will allow you to download a website so you can make yours look just like the real thing with uh, uh, logos, icons, and the whole thing. That's why a lot, number of these places have, have gone to something that you're going to see if you don't see the picture on the website that you're supposed to have there, then it's not in the correct location. And again, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between these. Not really a lot of them because the English is pretty bad, although some of them are getting better and better. Particularly in the spear phishing attacks, they do a much better job of putting the message together, making the email look authentic in order to do that. These are just some of the examples out of the book uh, that would be part of the uh, information in order to do those things. Here we have in this area here to update your eBay records. Let me get back to that. To update your eBay records, click here. And you need to, this is about part of the training for your, not just policy, but training for your uh, uh, clients that don't ever click anything in an email. If you want to do it, go out, go to the website yourself, kind of be sure that you're at the legitimate website before you do those things. And down here it says to unsubscribe. If you unsubscribe, what we've told them if you do that is we're now a an actual real email address so they can keep sending this stuff to you. Unsubscribing can sometimes do as much damage as anything else. in the wrong direction here. And these think, dear MSN member, similar circumstances here. As an MSN member, you will see this email. Let me go back now that I've got my marker up. Here we have the, let's click on it. Let's don't do that down here. To unsubscribe. All of those sorts of things. Click here to unsubscribe. You may or may not want to do that because if we go into the unsubscribe routine, we're getting into a situation that we may be uh, simply allowing them to know that the address is real. Here again we have to update. Just click on this link and it will take you someplace where we can get your uh, credentials. More, the payment is pending at the moment, but dear respected Washington Mutual, member of the Washington Mutual Bank. What these people will normally have in here, if they really know you, is your name. Not dear customer, dear client, dear respected, dear anything else. And even the, the, the ones that are not legitimate may actually have uh, your name in it. 
be careful about those things click to decline to stop payment button and all of these things don't click mostly you can on the links you can mouse over and it'll give you the full address and some of those are quite interesting as we look at them okay more fishing variations spear fishing uh, only specific users and these tend to be a little bit better farming uh, is going to redirect us to the fake site the one that is not the legitimate one Google phishing involves setting up their own search engines to direct you. So they're going to set up their own search engines to direct you to illegitimate sites. And these things, I've noticed that they kind of like putting these search engines incorporated into a number of the free softwares. Be careful and read very carefully what you're installing as you're installing the softwares because it may be that you're not what they're asking to accept and decline is not the thing that you bought that you want but something that has been incorporated in it ways to do these are the deceptive web links and look look at the web links mouse over uh, get the properties of it take a look at it and see if it is something that is real emails that look like web addresses or websites and one of the things they say that the can't make the at symbol, but the at symbol should never be part of a website address. And you can put lots of characters in a website address. Fake sender's address may be from somebody that you know. They may have co-opted somebody's uh, email uh, address book. I even get email, email, bogus emails from myself occasionally. Uh, the phone call stuff, my wife even got a phone call from herself the other day. So all sorts of different techniques to get you to talk to them, look at them, click on the sites. Ways, some of the things we've talked about already. The generic greeting, dear customer, dear valued customer, on and on and on. Poor grammar and misspellings, those are typical, I think, of what's going on pop-up boxes and attachments the legitimate places are probably never going to send you an attachment in one of these messages unsafe websites websites that appear to be legitimate but really aren't and an urgent request the urgency says oh I gotta get this done or there's going to be some consequences be careful of the urgent sites you've got to do this today within three hours right now five minutes whatever else that you may want to do that improperly recycled equipment we've talked about that a little bit donate or sell the equipment in any case in each of these the hard drive needs to go away because what you don't want is your company's information whatever was on that hard drive out in the open should have been deleted if the equipment is still available. Uh, there are softwares to make it go away if you want to leave the hard drives in, but you should make the render it, render everything that could be identified or could find information from the company, make it unusable. Simply deleting the file does not nece necessarily make the information irretrievable. With, some, with many operating systems, Windows being probably the many that's there, what, it, what we really do when we delete a file is change the first character. The information, and take it out of the directory listing, the information's still there, and there are a number of softwares, some open source, some cheap, some free, that you can go and find that information. You can recover the information. One of them that I used actually let you have it for free to see if there's inf anything there and if there was then you could pay them the thirty five dollars or whatever it was it wasn't that expensive and then they would allow you to uh, pay them and put a, an account and you could copy the information you could see it all but you just couldn't copy it until you actually pay them and so the data can be retrieved by an attacker we know that search engine scanning are important tools for locating information on the internet there is a whole separate area for Google hacking, Google search engines can offer advanced search tools and if you want to see those go into 
Google, or actually I think you have to search now for advanced search because it used to be on the website, but I think they took that link off. You can narrow the criteria. You can specify certain things that are on the website, a number of different things that we can do in order to make it more effective for us. Scour for important information. These are some of the things there. Uh, what we're looking here is the search is operator is site searches the web for search a specific website for a certain item. So we're going to go to Microsoft.com and search for security. So this provides a listing of every web page on the site that has information about security in it. File type, if we were looking for a specific file type, PDF, for instance, returns a listing of documents that contain security related information. And then in title, index of parent directory, a listing of files and directories on the web page that can be used to identify the desired information. So you can become more specific with your uh, Google searches. Dumpster diving. Source of secure information, number of advertisements, and I remember one few years ago where the guy's walking down the street and somebody has set out a whole bunch of papers on the uh, sidewalk to be to go in the trash or to go into recycling or whatever else. But he just goes and picks up a bill, and we get, then you can get enough information in order to be able to compromise somebody's. Uh, information. So files, letters, memos, passwords, all sorts of things go into dumpsters, go into the trash. Be careful about that both from a personal and a corporate standpoint. Lots of shredders, lots of shredding goes on and you should be very careful about that. Uh, I mean, you walk around and people put stuff in and, and they don't always get dumped. We have the magic arm that dumps our trash cans but sometimes as they're going from the trash can into the into the truck, a few pieces of paper get blown out, bank account statements, stock statements, uh, enough information that you can start building something to compromise somebody's identity. War driving is scanning the radio frequency airwaves. Anybody can do this. You can use a, a, a laptop with a, used to be a, Net Stumbler, now VI Stumbler for Windows 7 and above. Drive down the street and, and detect Insider is a good one, also I N S S I D E R, uh, to see how many wireless access points there are and how many of them are unsecured. How many of them, if they are secure, still have the default information? Because if they've got the default network name, default SSID, chances are that they may still have the default password. So you can do those things. Uh, these are techniques that you need to use against yourself in order to be sure that your network is secure. Anytime that you get on somebody else's network, in many, most, all, I don't know, you have to check your local laws, but if you do that, you may be setting yourself up for arrest, and you don't really want to do that. War driving is wireless location mapping. Uh, a number of the uh, applications allow integration with uh, locational data so that it actually will map using GPS, map the location of the access points. Finding the WLAN signal and recording the information about it technically uses an automobile to search these things. War flying uses airplanes instead of automobiles. War walking is where you just walk around and do that. Uh, war driving is not illegal. Uh, using the RF signal connected networks without the owner's permission can be illegal. You want to be very careful about that. Stay off of other people's networks unless you have permission to get onto them. Want to go out and try hacking web? Do it on one of your own access points. They don't cost that much. If you want to practice those things, go buy yourself a cheap one that has web, and see what you can do with it. Again, the objective is to protect our network, not to become a criminal and intrude on somebody else's network. More driving techniques: slow speed driving, uh, surface streets, 
create a plan and repeat it over time to see what's there and what's not there. A number of, if you do searches, there's a number of websites that will give you the location of wireless access points. Uh, the hardware, uh, a laptop or tablet for each of these things, uh, uh, something that is mobile. Advantages, the users can write rather than type if we're using a tablet. Handwritten notes can be immediately digitized. And you can have drawings, graphs, whatever else as we go through these things. This is a convertible tablet. This is an older system, obviously. Now they just hinge backwards or whatever else. Uh, we have a number of uh, computers that will become tablets and are able to use a stylus in order to write on the system. The ad that's going on right now is the uh, competition between the Mac tablet or laptop and the uh, Surface Pro because Surface is really making a, a touch and it's so you can write on it. And it's touch screen and all that other good stuff. So a number of different pictures of those things. Uh, mobile computing handheld, uh, PDA, PDA, when you see that now kind of think in the smartphone. Uh, smartphones or uh, tablets that have uh, cellular capability. We don't have to have cellular capability. Tablets that we're going to be able to look at networks with. Handheld PCs, a number of different pictures of devices as we go through these things. All of them limited battery life. To, uh, you can get a, an inverter obviously to plug into the car, into the into the power that used to be the cigar cigarette lighter now the uh, auxiliary port or whatever they're calling it that you can have an inverter that will actually power your small device so that you don't have to worry about the battery going dead for you while you're while you're driving got to have a NIC uh, on those things a standalone uh, all sorts of different NICs that we can have uh, in order to do that we have to have wireless uh, capability in order to find the access points. A uh, number of different, and I'm just going to click through the pictures of these things. Wireless card, the chipset, the RF monitor, passive methods, promiscuous mode, you really do need to put it into promiscuous mode, allows a wired NIC to capture the packets it receives. Promiscuous mode in Windows will not work with a wireless LAN. Promiscuous mode in Linux will. I think it's airmon ng space start, whatever it is, probably going to be WLAN 0. And when it starts up, it should tell you a monitor mode mon 0, for instance. And then when you go to Wireshark or whatever uh, sniffer you're using, you want to pick the monitor 0, the monitor mode. Monitor mode is going to be the promiscuous mode for the wireless. So in order to do that, we need to use Linux. And when we use Linux, the easiest ones, again, are either going to be Backtrack or Kali. Kali is the updated version of Backtrack, which has every tool known to man, I think. Well, actually, they keep adding them and taking them away, but a number of different ones that are there. Antennas, uh, an external antenna, something attached that gives you longer distance would be preferable. Frequency increases, wavelength decreases, and the size of the antenna is smaller, so... The higher the frequency, the smaller the antenna. Uh, antenna gain increases the coverage area, area, area narrows, and high gain antennas offer longer coverage. So when you're doing these things, a high gain antenna is going to give you a longer distance. A shorter or higher frequency, shorter wavelength gives you a smaller antenna, physically smaller antenna. The categories of these things, we've got omni, semi, directional and highly directional uh, antennas. The Omni is 360 degree of coverage. Uh, as we, and what you can think about these things is as we focus the beam we have the same amount of en energy whether it's omnidirectional or focused. So the narrower the beam the, the farther it will go. So semi-directional maybe a quadrant highly directional you can get it down to maybe a 10 degree band with a beam width or something like that 10 degrees at the end of the beam so it would focus all of the energy that was available in the omnidirectional antenna in a single very narrow beam 
which gives us the range. GPS, we kind of talked about that. You pro probably have used that, do use that. The Earth orbiting satellites continually transmit the signals and when we're doing more driving, if we want to uh, make an accurate map, you need GPS to put the access points on the map and the repeatable is to go back to be sure that they're still there and that they're still open. More pictures of war driving hardware. Nice picture here. Small antenna they put on the roof. Uh, the GPS receiver, the wireless NIC. So we have the GPS and the wireless going into the laptop. It combines those things into a map so that we have a wireless access point and a location of it. Detect, uh, to used to detect wireless and connect to that network when they first appeared weren't equipped to be aware of their presence. Uh, Microsoft's wireless zero configuration is something that came about Service Pack 2 of XP. XP Service Pack 2 really changed a lot of things in the Microsoft world. It allows you to more easily connect to wireless networks. Facilitates roaming between different wireless LANs, basically what we do there. Wire driving software, client utility statistics, and this is just things that are going to be there. Uh, signal quality on these things, and we have a distribution here from uh, poor up to excellent in the, in the link status mirror, the client signal utility meter. This is one that you view the wireless network, use the wireless to configure my wireless network settings. Uh, in here, once we're connected, and we talked about earlier turning off the uh, SSID, or not turning off, or we will actually talk about it, that's part of the next chapter, turning on or off the SSID, the identifier. One of the things that XP in particular may have an issue with is that if it has two networks, one with the SSID broadcasting and one without, it'll always go to the one that's broadcasting. There's a configuration that says connect to the, this wireless network when we configure it regardless of whether it's broadcasting the SSID or not. So you want to be careful about those. What's there, uh, choose a wireless network dialog box, gives you a list and, and this little area over here gives you an idea of how strong the signal is. This one's got two bars, the other ones here have what, one, two, three, four, five bars. Each of those have five bars when we do those things. Connected this is a manual network. Unsecured, these are secure, got the little lock on them. Security, enable wireless network. When you go to something like Insider, INSSIDER, it'll tell you what kind of security is on the network so that you know how it's being secured. A lot of free or free discovery. Net Stumbler is the one that works on XP but does not work on 7 XP. And I don't think I can do a not on 7. 7 VI Stumbler will do that and Insider will also uh, help you find these things, the signal strengths and frequencies that they're on and those sorts of things. Those are good pieces of software to try out if you haven't used them before. This is NetStumbler. VI Stumbler looks very similar to NetStumbler. We have the channels, the SSIDs, and the filters. We look at these things. It tells us the channel that they're on. Each of them will do that, what speed they're on. The vendor, whether it's an access point, and this is pretty old because we got WEP, what kind of security we've got on it, uh, the signal to noise ratio, uh, the signal strength as we go through these things. When we talk about signal strength, the minus 78, minus 73, this is in dB. The uh, lower the number, the better the system is going to be. This is a net number signal to noise ratio graph so that you can see how your signal and noise ratio work. Signal to noise, how much signal, how much noise, and what's the ratio between the two. Some other discovery softwares, and these are Linux systems, Kismet. 
Kismac and then Script Kitties and novices that don't really have any technical skills go to the internet, find something, and run a script itself. Uh, again, a number of tools. Linux is going to be the operating system of choice when we try to do anything in the security realm. Because that's where most of the tools are. Allows a lot more uh, flexibility than Windows does. Final step is to document and advertise the location. Again, number number of different websites that you can go to and search for wireless access points in my area. War chalking is something that I guess is still there. I've asked a couple of people and they say they occasionally see it. What it is is uh, physical marking with chalk uh, with about, uh, of information about an access point. But here we go. It's replaced by the online public databases and mapping sites. Google, basically. Uh, the uh, symbols that can be used, web protected, pretty old, closed network, SSID bandwidth for an open network. So a number of things that are there. Wi-Fi maps, public mapping sites that we can get we can get to this may or may not still be legitimate but if you go and search for uh, public Wi-Fi or free Wi-Fi or something like that in Google you'll get a map of the ones that are in your vicinity typically wireless sniffers monitor the network traffic is important to the health of the network what's going on you need to monitor your network what what is available on your network you need to scan your network what ports are open did some strange ones just pop up when we do these things SNMP SNMP and it, when you're using it you sh you need to use version 3 is the one that has security the other two SNMP 1 and 2 do not have any security with them allows computers to gather information software agents a MIB database uh, we can get information about it mapping of what goes on of the systems community strings a packet sniffer captures the TCP IP packets as they are transmitted and it does Wireshark being the most popular one if you're really going to do the, do something like that you may want to look at some other sniffers that instead of storing the information in memory which Wireshark does automatically downloads it to a file so that you can keep going over a longer period of time and once you have the file you can now manipulate it and use it instead of trying to do everything out of memory one of those would be TCP dump runs in Linux uh, it probably has been ported to Windows uh, that you can set it up to actually save to a file as it gets the information and once it's saved to a file you can go back and use whatever sort of management tool that you want in order to analyze the data instead of trying to analyze it all in memory and, it, and if you when you run out of memory Wireshark kind of just locks everything up be careful about that one capture data frames man, man management frames that's a big deal and that's why you need to be in monitor mode in order to look at the wireless frames the wireless management frames uh, access point advertises a whole bunch of information and that's really what I want to look let me go back here just a second I want to pause this thing and open my Wireshark okay I've got a frame here a management frame this is this is a capture from a wireless uh, sniffer that is in monitor mode and as we look through this things a lot of broadcasts going on and when these things broadcast the SSID is broadcast but it tells you an awful lot of information about the access point here we have the supported data rates uh, the channel that it's on the environment frequency the power is going to be in here somewhere the extended supports 4854 meg what it supports the capabilities 802.11n uh, is supported in this thing uh, the vendor and those sorts of things this is the SSID broadcast and we go over here and look at these things we have a beacon frame and the beacon frames are sent over what 100 uh, milliseconds or something like that so that's why you see so many of them 
as we go through here the beacon frame hip here I am want to connect to me when we do these things and we have something here we've got an acknowledgement flag uh, that there we go probe response something that's actually answered in the SSID here sky cart then we go back into the broadcasts and we get some information on Skynet the Meraki here is the name of the uh, access point this is the probe request is going to be the device that is trying to get onto it so we have a probe request on the SSID broadcast as we go through these things sky car skynet and all these are probe requests no real information being passed back and forth and we you see here beacon frame beacon frame beacon frame lots and lots and lots and lots of beacon frames and then we have some logical link control information here but you need to in order to see the management frames those these are the ones that you need to be able to put the system into uh, monitor mode in order to do that and here we finally get a SENAC we finally are connecting to something it looks like this frame here LLC you notice it actually has some data 141 bytes and it says that it's encapsulated Ethernet and when we look at the data kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense go down here to the bottom and look at the uh, at the information here ROA AP1 Roanoke so access point one is what it's connected to a lot of lot of traffic on wireless a lot of information on uh, each of the in each of the information particularly the beacon frames again we go through to gives us a, just a tremendous amount of information about the access point it has to have that because the other end's got to know how it's going to connect to the system with that let me get back to this the summary we looked at some general information, social engineering, wireless, uh, wireless locations, war driving, war driving software, what it is, the kinds of things that you can use, the war driving software, and then a little brief about wireless packet sniffers. The best thing about wireless packet sniffers is try them out, see what they will do for you. With that, I hope this has been useful, and thank you for listening.